Welcome back to Think Design Work Smart. I'm Alex Bolbock and I'm coming at you from the Mosaic Work Studios. And what I have for you today is a reaction to a post summarizing a few software design red flags. The post was um, published by Dr. Milan Milanovic and the software design red flags come from the book A Philosophy of Software Design. Uh, authored by Professor John Austerhout from Stanford University. I've heard really good things about this book. Unfortunately, I haven't yet had the time to read it, but I'm curious to look into the these design red flags because I feel that this conversation will be quite interesting. This is the initial pause, but I extracted the image separately just in order for us to be able to see it better <clears throat> so the first uh, red flag is shallow module the interface for a class or method isn't much simpler than its implementation and this is interesting i'm trying to think about examples of this um, because the code that i've been writing has focused a lot on simplification, on trying to keep things as simple and as easy as possible, which is why uh, one of the challenges for me is now to imagine things that are more complicated. I'll probably need to go see a lot more open source or published code bases. <clears throat> uh, uh, basically, in this case, what would be a good example? Let's say if you have a, I mean, a simple situation would be when a class has a ton of methods, of public methods, and therefore it doesn't hide, uh, it doesn't abstract away the details, but it just puts them right in your face. And you have classes maybe with 20, with 30, with 50 methods, um, and you look at those and you need to call them into specific order for a number of different scenarios because the class covers multiple scenarios. A similar thing can happen with a method if you have a, a number of parameters, uh, a large number of parameters, let's say seven or eight or ten, and some of them are in, some of them are out, some of them are passed by reference, so you can actually modify them inside the function. <clears throat> maybe it also has a return value, maybe it also throws exceptions. In that case, the, the interface for the method will be revealing too much of its implementation. Maybe that's another way to, to put it. Uh, when you have an interface that reveals too much about the implementation. You should be able to hide implementation details at the appropriate level of abstraction <clears throat> inside your class, in the inside your method. Otherwise, why are you using a method or a class? You know, that's the whole reason for it. Second one, information leakage. A design decision is reflected in multiple modules. So a design decision that is reflected in multiple modules, although, yeah, information leakage to me means slightly different. Now, what I can imagine here is that you have the same piece of information duplicated between different modules. And I see this a lot. And the key to avoiding this is <clears throat> identifying the domain model and separating your domain model from the rest of the code. Because in this case, you can separate the, the important pieces of information that evolve together into one place or that evolve with a similar speed, let's say, from the, uh, the areas of the code that evolve with a different speed, like user interface or other types of modules. 
So maybe this is one because to me, when I see design decisions, design decisions can mean a lot of things. It can mean the usage of a certain pattern. And if I have a design pattern in multiple modules, that's not a problem as long as the pattern is appropriate, appropriately used inside that module. So I don't like this, the way this is phrased. Um, because to me, design decisions are all decisions about structuring the code. <coughs> and that includes uh, what kind of methods you are using, what design patterns you are using, what objects you are using, how you structure code inside of methods and inside of objects and so on. So this can be, this is too general. When I see information leakage, it's more like, a piece of information that is duplicated between multiple modules. And this is something that would rather be, that I would rather avoid as long as those pieces of information are actually duplication, real duplication and evolving with the same speed. What do I mean by this? Well, let me give you an example from a, domain model let's say you are building a online shop and in an online shop you have a few bounded contexts one of them and the the different line the let's say the guiding line between the different bounded context is the notion of product but the notion of product changes from one bounded context to another you have a notion of product, which is the thing that is displayed on the in user interface of your online shop. And that notion of product is different from the, the notion of product that physically exists in your um, warehouse and that you need to pack and send, which gets you into the third bounded context, which is the actual packaging and delivery of a physical product. <clears throat> so in that case, you might call product the thing that is displayed in the user interface, and you might call product the thing that is uh, delivered or that you need to take from your warehouse and package and send, <clears throat> but the two are very different in terms of software, in terms of design, because the first one, you have a bunch of dynamic attributes that you can change over time, like pricing, offers, you know, all kinds of things. You have some things that are physical, like dimensions, weight, um, characteristics, what the, what the product does, and so on. But other things that you attach to it are not <clears throat> actually connected with the product that is in the warehouse in a, in a strong sense. They are largely decoupled. So then it makes sense to have a to make a difference between the notion of product in the warehouse and the notion of product in the user interface of your online shop. Okay. And because of this, you have to be very careful when it's really information leak, when it's really duplication. Duplication is when the thing the two things will evolve in with a similar speed or will change for the similar reasons. Non-duplication or fake duplication is when two things look, look like they are the same, but they evolve with different speeds or for different reasons. And yeah, if you think maybe in your warehouse, the packaging will change um, for the product, maybe the, the barcode will change, 
maybe the place, its placement in the warehouse will change, but this doesn't affect at all what is displayed in the um, shop, right? So we need to be very careful with this. Third one, temporal decomposition. The cost structure is based on the order in which operations, oh, yeah, he has a type of operations, operations are executed, not on information hiding. <clears throat> this is one of the hardest thing to do, I think. Um, and that is to deal with temporal, what I call temporal coupling. So when things need to be called one after another, or um, this is also something that relates to the interface of the classes. So it usually happens when you have a lot of methods in one class or when a class tries to do a lot of things. Now the thing is, how could you deal with this in a different manner? And one manner in which you can deal with this is actually a functional way. Think about your temporal process as transformations. Things get in, things get out, and then the things that get out go in into the next transformation, and they get out of that transformation. And in that situation, what you can do is to separate the steps either as functions or as objects, whatever you prefer, and then to compose them into one place, into a temporal uh, process. Because honestly, sometimes we need to do things in a certain order, we cannot avoid <clears throat> a temporal decomposition, 100%. But, uh, and you have this kind of temporal coupling, it makes it harder well, it makes it easier to introduce bugs. So you have to be careful with how you deal with that. And to be honest, I find it um, just to, to go on a tangent here. I've been learning the game engine Godot for the few past month or so. And really some of the things that are available in the interface of Godot, in the development interface, I'd like to see them into IDEs. One of the things that I really like is that you, it, it, when you are building a game, you need to create scene, a scene. That's one of the simplest way of doing it. And inside the scene, you have things that are nodes. The, the most abstract thing that you can create is a node. And each node can send signals, and each node can catch signals through some scripts. And I think this would be another way in which you could build this type of temporal processes based on signals. So I'm getting a signal that something happened, now I need to react, uh, send a signal that I'm done. Now, another nice thing about Godot is that you can actually visualize this fairly easily. <clears throat> it also helps because it's, um, it's more graphical. So imagine if you could see your microservices interacting with each other or your objects interacting with each other. That would be really cool. I mean, in a graphical manner and at runtime, dynamically, not at, uh, not through static diagrams. All right, closing the tangent now. <laughs> Overexposure. An API forces scholars to be aware of rarely used features in order to use commonly used features. Okay. Um, I mean, the one I can think about here is the way streams were treated in uh, Java. <laughs> I keep giving this example, but it's like, it was one of the worst attempts of doing 
design based on design patterns. Um, so basically what happened in Java, in case you didn't know, if you wanted to open a file and read every, all the text, so you need to as a text file, you wanted to read all the text from the text file in memory. As simple as that. You had to create, I don't even remember, but you had to create like three different classes. Uh, a buffer stream, a text, reader, uh, I don't know, there, there was a complete mess of things. And honestly, so an API, this is exactly what I'm talking about. It's, do I care whether that thing is buffered or not? Do I care? I might care if I'm optimizing things, okay? I, I come from a C++ background. Buffers used to be a lot, a big thing back when I was back in 2000s when I was writing code for a, um, for a NoSQL database engine, Avon La Lettre. But, and in that case, yeah, we paid a lot of attention to buffers and how large they should be and how they would align with the data that we would read so that, um, the buffer would contain a fixed number of integers, for example, because it was optimal and we wanted to have a performant database engine because it was processing a lot of different types of data. Absolutely, if you want that thing, perfect. But if my use case is I want to read everything from a text file in memory, because now I have a lot of memory, because text files are pretty small in general, and because um, I know that those files will be a few megs, maybe. Okay? I should have an easy way of doing that. Now, another way of thinking about this would be through the lens of a usability approach. Um, if you are using, you might have very powerful features available in a device, but you, what you want to have up front and very easy to access are shortcuts to the most used use cases. And I think um, we are not doing this enough. I believe that we should be doing this more. We should look at our APIs, at our classes, at our uh, microservices or services and think, okay, I can offer all these bells and whistles, but what are the top three common scenarios and how can I make those implementable with one line of code or with two lines of code or with three lines of code. And basically this is what uh, Groovy, a language that was built on top of JVM, this is what they did. In Groovy, if you wanted to read a file, it was a text file, it was basically a file of new file of path dot read all or something like that and you would get a string. And that's how things should be, right? <clears throat> Pass through method. So this is the fifth one. A method does almost nothing except pass its argument to another method with a similar signature. I can accept that in one particular case. And that case is when I'm trying to separate a public available API from a private implementation just before refactoring the implementation. Because I don't want to break the public API through my refactoring, because that to not be refactoring. And one easy way to do that is to basically create another class, delegate all the calls from the public API 
and in the public APL you just leave one line calls to the next layer which would be a private class with a non-published uh, interface and then you start refactoring because in that case you don't break the, the public API. But in general this is a waste and this just shows it's usually an expression of using or overusing certain design patterns. Like I've seen this with um, in Spring when you have service classes and they just have one line that calls another class. Um, Spring Boot or Spring. Repetition. A non-trivial piece of code is repeated over and over. All right. I don't think we need to focus on this. We discussed duplication a little bit. The same things apply here. Um, although maybe there's one counter argument here, which not many people agree with me on, but I still believe it's true. Repetition is good for learnability. So when you see the same pattern repeated over and over in your code, you are more likely to learn that pattern and to reuse that pattern later on. If you only see it once, chances are you won't repeat that, you won't reuse that pattern. So there is a trade-off here between learnability and maintainability which we need to be aware of. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't remove duplication when it's real duplication, but it does mean that we need to pay attention to the learnability aspect, particularly when you try to integrate a lot of people into um, your code base over a short period of time. Okay, so two, four, six, seven, special general mixtures. Special purpose code is not cleanly separated from general purpose code. I'd like to see an example of this, but I think it's similar with what we discussed before about overexposure. This may be a specific case. Um, Maybe it's in the implementation instead of being in the interface, but it's kind of the same idea. I mean, you should separate things that are specific from things that are more general. Um, yeah, maybe an example of this would be you have a long method and in the beginning it reads from a file and then it goes through the file and does some processing and then it writes into another file. <clears throat> the reading and writing, reading from file, writing to file, these are things that are specific because the same code could easily read from a HTTP request, from a stream, from a database and so on. Uh, so you could have multiple implementations there and the code that processes the data is the one that is special purpose, that is specific to your domain and that code needs to be more clearly separated from the general purpose code. So in general, if you think about it in terms of clean code, you would see long methods as a a symptom of this. If you think in terms of design, you will see a mixture of um, so breaking separation of concerns. Or you could think about it as code that is not cohesive because it mixes um, things that do not belong together. Conjoined methods. Two methods have so many dependencies that it's hard to understand the implementation of one without understanding the other. All right. Have I seen this? I haven't seen this recently. 
but it's basically coupling okay so that's very strong coupling between two methods uh, basically when you change one you need to change the other so in this case it would be whenever you make even the smallest change to one of them you need to change the other one the way to fix this is to refactor them into one method or a different separation of concerns restructure the code so that the concerns are otherwise uh, organized comment repeats code all of the information in a comment is immediately obvious from the code next to the comment yeah uh, so i am a proponent of a clean code and of code that expresses at most uh, the most it can without the need for comments however this does not mean that i will remove every possible comment from the code there are comments that are useful well there are comments that are useless there are comments that are meaningless there are comments that are misleading because they explain something and the code does something different because people have changed the code but have not changed the comment um, so i believe we should keep certain comments and in general the comments that add value to the code not all of them but some of them do add value to the code but these ones are absolutely useless and there is one edge case in which this comment is actually a documentation comment on top of so doc string or however it's called uh, that documents the function that the function called the function that's underneath the comment but even those comments should be treated with more care and should give more information so at minimum you should have not only the list of parameters the name of the method and what the method does but also how is this method supposed to be used are there any special cases for the parameters um, an example of usage might be really cool and one thing that i i would really want is the ability to generate and to introduce in the documentation that is automatically generate examples from the unit tests if you write the unit tests correctly you would also have nice examples of usage for that method and it might give you the scenarios for how to use that or the class because sometimes and often actually if you're doing design correctly you'd have multiple methods combined into a behavior so it would be nice to to have these things but yeah at least pay attention if this type of comment is inside the code just remove it because it doesn't add any values just noise if this type of comment is a documentation type of comment then modify it make it nicer think about your reader what would you like to read in the autocomplete in your ID when you try to call that method that is the situation you should be focused on implementation documentation contaminates interface an interface comment describes implementation details not needed by users of the thing being documented yeah i've seen this sometimes um it's hard to strike a balance here because some implementation details are actually useful but some are not so the way to deal with this and in general with documentation is to get feedback you know 
review the code, make some usability tests. So here is a simple thing you could do. Bring another programmer in from another team. Tell them about the class that you are working on and what it's supposed to do. Give them a task inspired from a scenario that is for that is resolved by this class. <clears throat> and watch them as they try to understand how to use the class from the documentation that show, shows up in the ID and see where they struggle and ask them what pieces of information are needed, what is missing and so on. And that's how you, you make things better. Vague name. The name of a variable of, or method is so imprecise that it doesn't convey much useful information. Yeah. Um, naming is a big, big topic. So, but in general, what you should do is to figure out names that are precise, that are clear, easy to read, easy to understand. Uh, not as easy as it sounds, <laughs> but yeah, don't, don't use names that are very, that are meaningless or that have meaning only to you, or that are funny, <laughs> okay? It's, it's good to have a funny name from time to time, but really it's good for, uh, for the morale, but it's not as good for maintaining the code. Hard to ping name. It is difficult to come up with a precise and intuitive name for an entity. I'm not sure this is a design problem because this is something that happens all the time. Um, coming up with names for things, it's, it's pretty difficult in general. So if you find it hard, you just need more practice. And the way to get practice is to learn more words, <laughs> basically, <laughs> and to Try to write more. Try to write an essay. <laughs> you know, that, that kind of thing. Hard to describe. To be complete, the documentation for a variable or method must be long. Well, this means that the variable or method packs a lot of features, a lot of behavior. And in general, this happens for methods if they are long, because short methods, they don't have the chance of doing too many things. Um, as for variables, I'm trying to think, I mean, variables should be fairly specific. If they are not very specific, then something is wrong. So I don't know. An example of a variable that is hard to describe, I find it a bit difficult. Maybe if it's very technical in nature, like, I don't know, kind of a parameter from a lesser known formula, maybe. But in that case, it's a matter of domain knowledge rather than of variable or design. So. I'm not sure what to think about this you know, in terms of variable. In terms of methods, generally, longer methods will have longer, more behavior. And if you have more behavior, you'll need more words to describe the behavior or more tests. And more tests, actually, because you, all, you also need documentation. I'm all for writing documentation in parallel with the tests. The two are complementary. Tests give you examples of how to use the code, but they don't tell you why you have that method. So write the documentation as answering why you need that method. 
And the last one is non-obvious code. The behavior or meaning of a piece of code cannot be understood. Okay, I think I've seen this quite a lot. This is code that is either written in a very convoluted manner or code that is um, packed into you know, basically doing too, too many things in one method. So in summary, I think, look, all these are pretty good. Um, but what I would still consider as the best ways to, to reason about design are one, clean code, because clean code gives you a set of rules or a set of heuristics, more likely, that you can look at and if those heuristics aren't followed, then it's likely that you have some design problems. The second one is coupling and cohesion. And in that case, you need to think about I mean, there are two ways of thinking about it, but the way I think about coupling and cohesion is the dynamic way, which is if this thing changes, how can this thing change, first of all? And if this thing changes in this specific way, what else do I need to change? And this is, this is what gives me a view on coupling and cohesion. So the things that change together will be more cohesive and then make sense together two different criteria the things that change separately need to be decoupled so um, to be in separate places or the things that don't connect to each other right those need to be decoupled and one of the key things in modern software design is to learn how to separate, how to decouple things as much as possible, I think. Now this has a cost, and the cost is often in performance, or in deployment, or in, you know, complexity moves in other places. And in the most decoupled way of writing a large piece of software is to write event-based microservices, but you are basically moving the um, uh, complexity into deployment, into operations, into debugging. Um, so you are trading off complexity. Cannot get rid of it. You are just moving it to another place. So <clears throat> there's always a trade-off to to have here and we don't want to have completely decoupled code because if you take decoupling to its extreme what you'll end up with is another programming language and you don't necessarily want that um, so you need to pay attention to these things and kind of find the right balance which is difficult to do and it's also quite different from project to project from code base to code base, sometimes from programming language to programming language or technology to technology. You need to figure that out. But starting from clean code, going to coupling and cohesion, and the last one, tests, not because you write tests last, but because you should probably write tests first, or ideally test-driven development. But um, the key here with tests is that tests will give you additional feedback on the design. And learning how to read the tests and the relationship between tests and production code will push you into the direction of better designs. Now, in order to learn how to do better designs, it's useful to study. And what you can study is things like design patterns. 
but make no mistake, it's easy to miss the important parts of design patterns. <laughs> design patterns are not just things that you, you know, a way of writing code or a way of writing a class. You need to pay a lot of attention to design patterns because they describe solutions to problems that repeat within a specific context. And you need to understand the context and the different types of implementation. Even if you take the Genga 4 book, you have at least two types of implementation, one that's based on composition and one that's based on inheritance. And in, it's really useful to look and compare the two and consider the trade-offs that are made in composition versus inheritance. And this is not necessarily in order to be able to, you know, talk in design patterns or overuse them, but it's more of a study for you to understand the different ways of doing design. And the last one would be, but that's, that's really a great way to understand software design better, is to practice using katas. So take a small problem, but then set some constraints on yourself. And you can find the code retreat constraints, for example, and try those out and see how your code ends up and how the designs are different, what choices you are making differently, and what are the trade-offs between the different solutions. These are called design studies, and in any other design discipline, it's something that we would be taught and we would practice again and again and again. You, in, in any design school, like industrial design or something else, you will not be allowed to come with just one solution and say, this is my solution to the problem. You need to come with three, five, ten different solutions to the same problem and discuss their trade-offs. So this is the kind of mindset that you need to have for, let's say, a better, becoming a better designer. And make no mistake, you are a designer because code the way you structure your code, the decisions you make in structuring your code, this is what design is. And maybe, okay, maybe there is another level on top of that, but that's where it starts. All right, this is it for uh, today. I hope you find this interesting. Um, what do you think about these red flags? Do you see any other red flags? Do you have examples of the ones that I couldn't think about. Uh, what other design challenges do you have in your code, in your teams, with your managers? <laughs> Let us know in the comments. We love comments. We answer those as quickly as we can. And expect more videos soon. Thank you kindly for the view and until next time, remember to think design and work smart.